All right. So welcome, let's get started. I wanted to introduce Willie. Um, many of you know Willie. Willie's work has been the subject of several one-person museum exhibitions. Um, several of his sculptures were included in Reconfiguring an African Icon, Odes to the Mask by Modern and Contemporary Artists from Three Continents, which, which opened in March 2011 at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. We were very blessed to have his work at the Cameron Art Museum in 2015 for School Pride, the Eastern North Carolina story in conjunction with Countywide Community Development Corporation. And it, he took, Willie took the story of desegregation in Eastern North Carolina and translated it into an emotionally charged multi-gallery installation that referenced personal experiences and historical events. Willie, thank you for being here. Willie, I'd love to start with a little bit um, of your background. I read that you made, you made art installations in your childhood bedroom um, and that your work from bo with bottles came from your weaving and knitting with your grandmother. Um, can you tell us um, about how you were first drawn to creating art? Well, as hokey as it might sound, I usually answer that question by saying that I was an artist in a previous life. So it just came to this time with me. So I don't remember the exact origin other than that. I know that at three years old, my mom found me in the kitchen drawing comics from the Sunday paper. And that's when they said, oh, an artist. <laughs> she said I was pretty good, just copying Mickey Mouse and, and uh, Blondie and Dagwood out of Sunday newspaper. And, um, so that's, that's how I got the title of being the artist in my family. Right, right, right. Um, and what stories, what stories did you tell with your art as a young person? Well, I come from a long line of, uh, of ministers. So I do a lot of drawings from the Bible. Wow. You know, creation story, I did Moses, those kind of things. But yeah. I also... Without, I would say, it's probably clear to say, I also did the story of Africa, America, because my family subscribed to Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine, and I would be drawing from those every week. Like I would draw the centerfold from Jet every week because I knew that artists drew nudes, and the centerfold of Jet was always a woman in a bathing suit. It's close I come to nudes as a little kid. <laughs> But you could also say I did, did this history of pop culture because I sat in front of a television screen with a big cardboard divide, divided in 16 squares. And I would try to draw from the TV screen one character from every cartoon as they ran across. I realized they only had front view, side view, and three-quarter view. So I would sit and wait until they returned to that position and continue to draw. So I think that's the answer. And you, then you went to the School of Visual Art in New York and studied with Chuck Close and Jonathan Borofsky. And you've done all kinds of things. You pursued, pursued music and theater, and you've written children's books, sitcom scripts. You even started a nonprofit. But it seems like in your work, you keep coming back to sculpture. Um, what is it about sculpture that compels you to keep creating? Well, if you take those approaches to create creative expression, writing, music, performing, and visual arts, I have always done them all equally. It's just that the world only pay attention to my sculpture. Oh. <laughs> so that's what it appears to be the dominant interest in my life. But every night I'm in here, you know, hitting the guitar for like two or three hours. And I write at least one hour every day. So, what are you working on right now? So I'm still, I think, I think that all, all creativity is an expression of an energy, and you can take that energy and apply it to anything. Like my mom is an artist, but her studio is her kitchen. She's an amazing cook. So I put my creativity to anything, and hopefully I get decent results. What am I working on now? Um, in different, different things, I'm actually working on a children's story based on a character that was creating one of my sculptures called Shoe Fly. 
I collected uh, high heel stories from Facebook by requesting it. And I'm combining those stories to make a longer story about the bug that flies in a woman's ear and convince her to buy more shoes. And that's the shoe fly. <laughs> so my, so my shoe fly is made out of high heel shoes. And I have it as sculpture, but I also have it now as a game and approaching a children's story, illustrated story. Uh, in the fine art realm, I'm working on a piece for, the, uh, for a show called A Night in America that will open at Beta Pictorius Gallery in Birmingham, Alabama on September 18th. Uh, my piece in that show so far is, uh, it's almost like a graphic design chart of all the African Americans who have been killed through racist police action. And right now that's a grid of 88 faces with their names underneath them. But because of my history and my brand in the art world, they're not, I'm not showing the faces, I have a scorch to represent each one. Even the shape of a scorch with the point of the iron down is almost like a face. And the, the violent act of scorching shows in each impression on the wood. So it communicates uh, more than just their names as a result. Um, but there's a lot of this I'm working on too. I mean, I can give you a long list, you know, it's, it's a list that keeps me awake all that long. I'm not a great yeah. sleeper. Yeah, that that's amazing. That's wonderful. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit about school pride or move to, in that direction. Um, your father um, was part of the great African-American migration from the South and left North Carolina. He left Regalwood in the 1940s to move North. Um, but you still have relatives down here near us. Um, mm -hmm. Had you been here before um, you came down to work on school pride and did you know any of the schools? Did you know any of the stories of the schools before you worked on the exhibition? I did not. Um, most of my North Carolina visits were probably from 1955 to hmm, maybe 1955 to 1965 because my parents divorced and my mother was not from the Carolinas. So I didn't visit much after that until I was an adult. Um, but I suspect that I have an uncle who I believe was a student during the time of school desegregation. And Anne, I'd love it if you could talk a little bit about how School Pride came to be. How did this exhibition um, come to the Cameron Art Museum? Heather, as, as best as I can recall, um, uh, representatives from an organization from Navassa, North Carolina, and Willie, you have relatives that live in Navassa. Oh, my, my, my cousin is the mayor. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. You have relatives who are leaders in Navassa. Yeah. So those of us joining us, Navassa is just across the Cape Fear River from Wilmington. Um, and it's economically, um, the stabilizing economic driver for Navassa for many years, and I think this um, affected your family, Willie, was um, it seemed the major employer was a fertilizer plant that closed. Yeah, they started, they started that town. They, they were, uh, they found a certain kind of uh, animal droppings, I think it was bat droppings, Mm -hmm. off the coast of Cuba, and they, I guess they, which they cultivated that, dug it up, <laughs> transported it, towed it to uh, the mainland, yeah. and started uh, the town of Nevassa. Yeah. And one of the slaves they brought with them were brought from Cuba. So a lot of African Americans in Nevassa have roots that go from West Africa to Cuba to the U.S. Mm. My great great grandfather spoke fluent Spanish. And my dad has a Spanish name, but it's, you know, it's a name that he uses when he's having fun. So I don't, I don't know the origin of the name, but he always says a different name when he's uh, feeling good, you know what I mean? <laughs> 
Do you remember the name? Do you recall the name? Um, yes, but I'm expecting myself. Yeah. We had I, respect, the, I respect for him. We had the great good fortune to meet your father in the course of this exhibition. It was, it was, it was one of the redeeming, many of the redeeming moments of working with you and your family. But Heather, back to your extraordinary question, um, we received a phone call from representatives of an organization called Countywide Community Development Corporation out of Navassa. And they wanted to meet with us regarding a compelling idea for an exhibition. And we said, sure, absolutely. And so, and in, um, a fierce, a proud, a brave woman named Juanita Harper um, came to the appointment with other members of the corporation and said, Anne, thank you so much for meeting with us. We have an idea for an exhibition and um, we are all members of, we are all alumni of schools that closed in Southeastern North Carolina. We are representatives of 16 schools that closed during the kickstarting of desegregation in Southeastern North Carolina. Well, my ears perked up because I'm from Wilmington, North Carolina, and um, not at all experiencing what Juanita and, and her compatriots experienced, but, but I was um, a white kid who was bused to um, Williston School, which was the premier African American school in our region. I mean, it was it was the excellence in music and sports and academics and you name it. Williston was a real contender in Wilmington, and I knew that growing up. And for some reason, Williston was closed very um, suddenly um, during 1968 in order to hasten the work with desegregating schools. And so these individuals were from schools that were equally suddenly closed to affect um, the first stages of desegregation in North Carolina. It's my understanding that a high school in Charlotte started, it was the first school that was closed and it was an African-American school that was closed to start this process. But Wilmington and Southeastern North Carolina followed this rigor, this sudden and violent um, application. And so, of course, when Juanita came in with her, with her friends, fellow alumni from schools that were closed, it personally resonated with me because I was somewhat involved with, with that act, with my own life as a ninth grader. And so I said, Juanita, this is, this is an important subject. We are honored that you came to us, but I must admit I am mystified as to why you came to Southeastern North Carolina's Art Museum with this thesis, with this theme for an exhibition. May I ask, why did you not seek out a history museum? And she said, Anne, art heals. This exhibition must take place at an art museum. And so I said, of course, let's proceed. And we had not the faintest idea what on God's earth we were going to do, but we knew we would do it together. Yeah, yeah. And um, so that, that, was the, that was the spark of it, Heather. Please, yeah. please continue. That, that's extraordinary. What an extraordinary thing for Juanita to bring to you. So, so, so you guys were given this, this historical story 
to tell that has deep personal meaning and emotional impact. Um, how did you, I guess this question is for Bob, Ann, and Willie, how did you go about articulating that story through an installation? And I do, I have pictures that I can, I can share too, um, if you'd like to use those to talk um, while you're talking about it. Yeah, I'd have to say, huh? go ahead, Willie. I was going to say Juanita and her organization really told the story. Yeah. They all donated things and shared conversations. And we just kind of just interpreted that to make it a visual experience. Uh, even you, if you interpreted that, that making that a visual experience. Well, you, you helped me a lot. You helped me, you helped me find <laughs> that, that wood debris and carry it back. <laughs> That was the beauty. Yeah, but I feel it was, that it was their story. Maybe for me, it was also a lot of curiosity. Heather. It was um, a lot of curiosity because of the family connection, too. And I actually felt. I felt that it was some magic in there because you guys did not know that I had a connection to the town of Nevassa. And you brought me on board. We so did. I proceeded like it was divine, you know, that I'd be there doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it was divine. I believe that to the core. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Heather, if, I'm, if I may share our first, um, our first mode of production was just to try to build inventory for Willie to work with and respond to. Um, Basically, we began to understand that wholesale closing um, and attempted eradication of a culture, of a people, of a community is a cultural revolution. And throughout the history of the world, all of the planet Earth, there has not been one cultural revolution that has been entirely, totally successful because there are fragments that remain there are memories that remain, there are oral stories that remain. And so, as we were talking with members of the alumni of these 16 schools, we realized, well, oh yeah, well, so-and-so still has trophies from when he won X basketball tournament. And, sh and she's got, you know, her prom program. Right from this year and, and we've got that school newspaper clipping of when that great basketball shot was made. And so we got this idea to, to digitize any material culture, any of those fragments, those, those bits of the stories that remained in any kind of materiality and of course oral culture from these schools. And we wanted to build up the inventory that Willie could then respond to and play with and interpret and ingest. And so that, that was our starting point because mm -hmm. he, he had so much to bring to it already, but we, we very much wanted to tie. He was so respectful and responsible to, to, to building the stories from from the 16 schools but but he needed the inventory to play with and do you have any idea how many people from the community contributed in that digitization day that we had at the Cameron Art Museum I do not I do it was not. a crowded day yeah <laughs> and it was more it was more than one day yeah yeah um so one of my questions well, actually, I'll go back a little bit because, Anne, you said that you didn't know that Willie had uh, connections in southeastern North Carolina, which I had forgotten that. Um, so I guess my question is, how did you find Willie? Um, and how did, how did you connect with Willie? And then, Willie, how did you decide um, that this was a project that you'd like to work on? Heather, I, I can't actually remember because I, I think early on we were thinking of working with more than one artist, you know, cause this was such a big project. Mm. And I think, I think we were thinking of working with a female artist as well as 
as as a male artist we were we were just trying to broaden this perspective mm -hmm. but once we um began our discussions with willie we realized no he is the true keeper of these stories he he is the individual that we trust to represent the conscience and the soul of this story and so we 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 just trusted wholesaling and of course we went with the top artists of this area we were interested of course in artists with with north carolina connections but um for willie to agree to work with us on this project when he said yes there was no turning back and i think i remember willie you had just had an exhibition at the weatherspoon in Greensboro um, and that may have been part of what brought you to our attention mm -hmm. um, so Willie when Anne approached you yes. um, what drew you to the project? Well the fact that uh, you know I had those Nevada roots mm -hmm. and that I have had a disconnection with my my parents separated from my Nevada roots yeah. but I'm actually still Reestablishing today. Yeah. But I saw it as a chance for me to uh, understand, well, really to understand, you know, why my dad and his brothers all had GEDs or nothing at all, right. you know, considering the school structure there. Uh, and trying to update my memory of the Carolinas, because when I would visit as a little kid, it was just a, a big farm, like a hog farm you know, with dirt roads and uh, just like Tom Sawyer's kind of. Um, so it gave me a chance to, to visit family in Nevada and get an update on the town itself. And you know, it was just beautiful, a beautiful dive into my own family history in a lot of ways. Did you learn anything about your own family in the process? Well, let's see. Well, I did learn that my, my uncle Freddie went to school with some of the people on the committee that remembered him from the school. And he, did not, he didn't graduate, but he, did, he was part of the whole uh, school uh, change there. And that's, that's the most personal thing that I learned. Uh, actually, more personal things. I learned that a lot of people are my cousins. <laughs> it was funny, I had the same experience on Instagram and Facebook. Suddenly I had cousins I didn't know I had. So I learned that when I was there. Uh, when my dad came to the opening, I had a lot of cousins there also that I didn't even know. <laughs> and for most of them, this is the first time in the museum or any museum at all. So that I was proud to be that bridge for them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd like to go through some of these pictures. Um, all of you watching, you can see this is the list of the 16 schools that were closed. And on the right, Willie, can you tell us a little bit about this image? Um, we have the blackboard in the back and the desk yes. in the foreground. Yes. Well, this image shows a classroom. And the classroom, I think, contains either four, five blackboards. I started doing blackboards uh, many years ago, realizing that whenever I speak about American culture or American history, my roots of knowledge come from being in a classroom. Mm -hmm. So now I use the blackboard to address those things by making sent sentences that I call backronyms that are the keyword, each letter of the keyword becoming a new word. Like uh, the one image here, the keyword is black at the top. But each column are words that begin with, with that letter. And I know one of them in my memory says B L A P K, be like a colored king. Mm -hmm. So they're saying things like that, but from all different directions pro, con, positive, negative, PC, un PC, yeah. almost sounding like, uh, like uh, blurbs from the newscast or newspaper. Right. I mean, I got the style of writing from Ernest Hemingway. He would really write short, short senses that just hit it right on with every word. So that's why I attempted doing these pieces. So in this show, I had uh, the word black and the word white, of course, but also the word civil and the word white 
for civil rights, and then a, a board that people could uh, write their own backronyms on. I forget what the keyword was on that board, <laughs> but I have, I still have a couple of these boards in my storage bin now. And we have one in the museum. Um, so it was a classroom environment that included. Yeah, I'm glad too. <laughs> we are too. We are too. Uh, I'm doing one now with the word virus, actually. Ah. Uh, yeah. Are you a poet? <laughs> Do you write poetry? Well, if you need, if you need an assistant or a prompt, let me know. <laughs> I write songs. I guess it's kind of like poetry. Yeah. Yeah. When I, I was in high school and college, I was part of a traveling group of poets. And we did a lot of poetry and drum. We were like, we were like the last poets, or like Gil Scott Heron. There were four of us, and we would just drum and recite poetry. All oh, that's New York amazing! City. That's amazing. And nowadays, I pretty much write songs, screenplays, and short. I've got. Yeah. I'd love to show another picture. So that notebook, I guess, is where people would write their their thoughts. Right. Thanks. Willie. Um, yeah, since the whole thing was about being transported to other schools, I decided to. I don't know if all of you are frozen or it's just me, but if you can hear me. I can hear you. I want to address the. I want to address the the distance between the schools and the transitions and transformations for the students by showing a map that went from one district to the other and spoke about the schools in each district. So we got these these houses here. I forget what their original purpose was, but with the help of Bob and one other guy whose name I remember, we converted Nate. all these Nate. David. David. Mm -hmm. We converted yeah. all these houses into schoolhouses. We even changed the look of them on the outside. And inside there's a, a small video monitor that is showing uh, photos collected from the community uh, where each school is located. Those photos, of course, were submitted, you know, by, by the uh, CD, what was it called? CDS, CDC, Community Development Corporation, CDC. Yes, they gave these photos. So we have a monitor at each one so you can, you can follow the route to the school you went to and you can stand and look at images of your high school days inside the schoolhouse. Willie, was there any additional pressure or did you feel any additional pressure on you as an artist because you were working with people's personal objects and mementos? Um, did you feel, um, was that difficult for you? Um, well, no, my, my way of working is to not think of myself as in charge. Yeah, well said. So it's just about, you know, like I want I wanted to drink this pineapple juice and it's in the cup, but the cup is not in charge. So it's, it's kind of like that. So I am the, maybe the breaker switch that has to be turned on to allow the energy to run through to make the creative process yeah. visible. And, and you could feel that in that exhibition. You could feel that artist as almost a conduit um, to tell this, this greater story. Okay, yeah. let's see if I can go to another picture. Okay, so here's a closer look at one of the blackboards. Yeah, so you see they're marked up almost as if they are in a schoolroom when a teacher corrects your paper, mm -hmm. they cross words out and add other words in. So of course, for, as an artist, that kind of ties me to uh, New Expressionism and graffiti, but also which, uh, ties me to education learning process. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I worked for several years as a graphic designer, so the colors of red, black, and white were, were said to be the most powerful colors for communication back in the 70s. Also with my, my interest in tribal arts and tribal culture, red, black, and white are the colors of the warrior spirits. Mm. So seeing these mm. colors triggers that subconscious awareness in people. I mean, if, if those stories are true and these colors have warrior power, when you see them, you get the vibration from it. Mm. If you don't know the story, you appreciate the graphic design quality 
and strength of the combination. But as I as it as it as it goes through me, I'm aware of all these things. Yeah. And most of these sentences are. I mean, I could have said almost anything. I try to really make them relevant to race relations and relevant to the key word. I think the expression. I try to make them conceptual as well as contextual. So I mean, I could have said, you know, like Barbie loves anything called Ken, but that has nothing to do with black. That was amazing. <laughs> but it has nothing to do with black, so, you know. Like this one, it says, boy, boy lent as courthouse candles. That makes me shiver. Yeah. Yes. You know, I have, I have backgrounds in my computer for the word God, and my favorite one is, uh, Grilled or drowned? Ooh. That makes me shiver. It's like, you know, God's going to give you a choice. Grilled or drowned? <laughs> so I like a sentence that just like, boing, hits it like that. So it takes some, it takes, a, it, it, once you get to the rhythm of it, it goes really nicely. Mm -hmm. uh, once I start with a word, it's in my mind almost forever and I can hear it in so many ways. How long did, <clears throat> excuse me, so you how see long? I'm, I'm playing on, on the cliches, wild, hairy, and cute topples <laughs> empire. How really, long? How, yeah, how long did this installation take? And this part of your statement. Oh, the entire installation may have taken a week or two. Maybe two weeks. Yep, that sounds about right. I think we I think two weeks. We obviously started gathering, putting dollhouses together, many homes together, a bit before. That's right. Yeah, right. but I think the actual right. installation itself was was a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. And that's incredible. Did you do pre work before you came down? Um, did you have access to information prior to? Um, or did, what, did this just kind of all consume you during those weeks you were here? No, I did have some information before I arrived, but I was fortunate enough to also be there during one of the digital collecting days mm -hmm. and got more information just from being on, on the set at that moment and speaking with people. Mm -hmm. Most of these uh, phrases, though, were written while I was down at the camera. Mm. I think this is the last blackboard. Yeah, there's some of them, like I, I have boards with the word America, but most of these boards, I find some of these sentences are still relevant yeah. in today's politics or today's world. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. resisting integration got him to the Senate. Yeah, I'm sure that relates to somebody who's in the Senate now. Absolutely. And there's another look at the desk and the board. And this yes. is one of one of my favorite images. Um, I'd love to hear you talk about this this room. Right. Well, I was recalling a uh, Martin Luther King quote, a drum major for peace. Oh. So, you know, I'm I'm kind of like a uh, I don't know, so many ways to describe it, but I'm a, I'm a word person. Yeah. And, you know, my mind, I'm, I'm always jumping tracks in my mind. So something traveling along this lane will suddenly connect with something on this lane and then suddenly there's a new road that happens to me throughout the day. I took, I took his phrase, I realized he said drum major. Oh, drum major, that's something that happens in high school. So, okay, so now I can make the connection between the high school and the civil rights era, so I became drum major. And we projected the images from behind, I believe, of various civil rights activists onto the, onto the uh, skin of the drums. So it gave the room a nice lighting effect, as you see here, which is beautiful. Right. And it's one of my favorite rooms as well. Yeah, it's gorgeous. Of course, I always have regrets afterwards, things I should have and could have and could have and would have. Uh, <laughs> 
But if I don't know if I could run back time, I can make this 100% better by adding the thoughts I've had since it, since it opened. Mm -hmm. So if you do a revisit. <laughs> This, was this is interesting to me because I wanted to express the violence of the civil rights movement and I was able to do it with the trophies from the high school. And of course, we had to give the trophies back to the uh, community members afterwards, but I would have loved to have kept this piece and cast it in bronze or something and blown it up to like life size. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I was thinking uh, how just when you think you get the whole world in your hands, here comes a policeman with a billy club. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and that was one of the things I was telling Heather and Anne earlier, and it happened in every gallery, watching, watching your brain work with all the information you were giving was fascinating throughout the whole process, and specifically with the trophies. I, I remember you looking at, I, I want to say it was a basketball trophy of a figure with his hands up shooting the ball and without it, you know, the second you saw it, you had turned it around and had the figures with their hands against the wall. And I just thought you were, the way your right. mind works with everything was so enjoyable to see. Well, see that's, the whole that's, that's, yeah, that's why I say it said open circuit. You know, yeah. it's like, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not birthing. I'm just presenting. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> it's like I didn't have the baby, but I brought it out to show to the father. <laughs> so I heard you guys talk a little bit about gathering um, wood and rubble. <laughs> Can you tell us what's going on in this picture and what your process was here? Yeah, yes. Well, you know, some schools were torn down, closed down, torn down. So I wanted to show that somehow. So I wanted to bring as much rubble into the uh, building as I could at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I said we have one desk in there. That was an effort to tie the whole thing to the schools. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would have loved to fill the whole room square by square, every square foot of it with rubble and cut mm -hmm. a little tunnel inside. You have to walk through and look up. You see the stuff all around here. <laughs> mm -hmm. But that would have been a much bigger and more difficult challenge. Can you tell, um, just to, yeah. I was just going to ask, can you tell the people here um, about the process that you guys went through to gather this rubble and to bring it into the museum? Yes, I think from my travels each day, I had noticed certain areas where I could get scraps and rubble. I forget where they were what the locations were, but I know with the help of, of Bob, we did find piles of, of uh, discarded or torn down building materials. And I remember, I guess Bobby must have had a truck or something. We loaded up and we yeah, I can't remember stuff. how we got it. Yeah. Well, I know we found it close to the so, river road. Yeah. What's that? Yeah, I, I don't remember how we got it either, but I remember, you know, what I really remember is standing there looking at the rubble outside of the museum and Anne being there, and it was either mud or snakes that got a big reaction from you. Snakes. 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 <laughs> I remember that very clear. <laughs> it was a big black snake, yes. It was a beautiful snake. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was the first guess. board. It was the first board that you picked up, I think. And that snake was lying underneath it. Well, first like I was working around the other side. <laughs> first I was working with a snake hunter, so there was no problem. <laughs> <laughs> so no, it was it was great. And this is, you know, I am. You know, I went to school in, in, 70, in the 70s, 72 to 76. Photorealism was the main genre uh, that they were teaching at that time, painting like a photograph. But there was also a lot of residue from the Art Provera movement in the galleries. Uh, Art Provera, Art of the Poor, where there were things made from piles of rubble, uh, things that were found and just displayed. And I was very inspired by that. Also, growing up in the big city of Newark, 
uh, during the what I call the, the Black Awareness Movement time, there were a lot of neighborhoods that were destroyed. And I made installation in my room because I was two blocks away from a, dis a destructed area and I could go and just find things to bring into my room to make things as a little kid. Mm. Uh, so this kind of took me back to that experience too. Mm. Mm. Willie, I think one of the things that affected me so deeply about this exhibition, and I still don't know that I can articulate it, was the energy. You could walk into the brown wing and you could feel this. It was palpable, um, the energy of memory um, in the exhibition. And I've heard you talk, uh, talk about energy and this work. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about energy and how it connects with, um, with, with the work that you create, not just School Pride, but um, your, your other works that you create. Right. Well, I, th I don't want to say I think. I, I would love to say I know, <laughs> but I can't give you any written proof. So, <laughs> But I proceed as if everything in the world is energy. Mm -hmm. All that we see is an illusion, yeah. but what really exists is just energy. Yeah. And the energy is pulsating. Everything around you is in motion, even though it looks still our perception makes it appear still and solid. So when two things are vibrating at the same rate, they join together and create a different illusion. So like on this piece here, I wanted the energy of destruction and rubble. So of course I'm gonna bring rubble into the gallery. Uh, so my desire brought me to that awareness that brought the piece into the gallery. Um, I think it, a lot of it begins with, with my desire to, to bring the energy out of something. Because this is a question I've, I've received before from people and I try to analyze it and make sense, but it is some, somewhat esoteric and really hard to explain. Like I, st I think about the aesthetics of uh, some of the, say the Yoruba traditions or, or Congolese imagery where the compression of materials, you can feel it, but it's a physical compression of energy that, that makes the sculpture and you can feel it because you can see it. <laughs> so so I, I, to make it academic, I, I, didn't, I tried to think about the, uh, the higher faculties of the human mind and touch and employ as much of that as I can in each piece. So that would be, um, that would be intelligence, intuition, memory, will, imagination. Yeah, I think that's it. But all, all those things, especially memory, because I want to trigger memory in you by bringing these energized components together to trigger memory in you. Mm -hmm. So that right away right, right is my will or my desire. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, these are the results that come out. Mm -hmm. I think you could also feel in the galleries the energy of all the people um, that have participated in the, um, the information gathering and had lent their objects. Um, it, it, was, it was a beautiful thing. It was a wonderful exhibition, Willie. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, collective stuff is... Of course, collective energy is like double your pleasure, you know? <laughs> Not just my energy, but the other people involved. It just makes it even vibrate even more. Yeah. As I said, one of the factors of, uh, of the high factor of the mind is, is memory. So people bring, come into the space, that's what's triggered in them, so it becomes present in the whole room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to show this picture, <laughs> this wonderful picture. This is one of the examples of the pictures um, that people brought. This is um, a class from Gregory Elementary School from 1954. I love there's one little boy who's making a silly face. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's just amazing, amazing picture. Um, 
Willie, I have just a couple more questions for you and then we'll open it, open it up to the group. We've got, we've got questions already lined up for you. Everyone wants to ask you questions. Um, I wanted to ask you about your t-shirt. Um, on your website, you're selling these shirts that say Black Lives, uh, Black Art Matters. Um, and you write, it's hard to say Black Lives Matter without That's recognizing um, the value of graphic representation. After all, a people's art is a record of a people's existence. This is why Black Art matters. Can you talk about this a little bit for us and show us your shirt? <laughs> Oh, well, that's the easiest <laughs> part of showing the shirt. <laughs> <laughs> we all want your shirt. <laughs> and everybody, you can go purchase one of these shirts on Willie's website, and I will put the link. But, you know, I, I, and, this, and this is a Black Lives Matter shirt number one, but now we're at like 2.0. It's a much nicer shirt. <laughs> where this comes in different colors. You can get it in gold or blue. And there's an image on the back to represent my, my work personally, like a scorch on the back. Oh, very cool. Um, so this was my pet, cor my pet cor project, but it's grown into a bigger thing through collaboration with another, with a bigger company now. But it has to do with my experience as an artist, you know, um, in the 70s, I was part of a demonstration in front of the York Museum because we felt there was no black art in the museum. And we, we did a tremendous uh, protest involving fire and music and everything. And um, throughout school, I, I went to art school in the 70s, but never studied about any black artists. We just studied art. Even in high school, and I went to high school in the city of Newark, uh, we studied European art, classical Greek art, and but once Amiri Baraka came to Newark, uh, or Leroy Jones was his previous name, we suddenly started studying African art in high school. So that was that was great. Uh, but then in the art world, the so-called professional art world, like th that I entered in the '80s. I recognized that none of the galleries or a few of the galleries represented black artists. It wasn't until Jean-Michel Biascott passed away that every gallery went out and got one black artist. So all that led to this awareness for me. And I guess sell your shirts. Oh, I'm sorry. Can we sell your shirts at the museum? You can, you can, <laughs> of course. I already have orders from a couple of museums. And I partnered with a company that specializes in museum uh, gift shop distributions. So they're now doing all this, all the work for me now. <laughs> but originally it was my daughter and I just doing this. Well, when we get to so Rio. On my website, you can place your order. Yeah, yeah that'd be great. Awesome. So I just have one last So, um, yeah, so the world is listening. Oh, I just wanted, I wanted to know if you could tell us a little bit about your work that's for consideration um, on the High Line in New York City. Oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for bringing up these moments of like commercials in, in the midst of the main program. <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> it's all great stuff. <laughs> well, the High Line for people who don't live in New York, is a beautiful elevated park area that used to be a subway uh, track. And they have art all along the trail. And it goes for many miles. I, I'm not sure how far it goes. I don't live in New York, but of course I've been to the High Line. But there's one area that has a plinth that is a pretty good sized plinth. And they commission an artist to put a piece there every, every few years. And it's all by nomination, and I was fortunate enough to be nominated this year to present a concept. Um, I chose to do something made out of high heel shoes because I'm really into that for the past 10 years. Uh, the shoe is a great building block. It contains so many shapes and forms, comes in different colors. It's a loaded object. It means something to everybody. Everybody's got a high heel story. They hurt my feet. I don't like them. She does good in them. There's always something about a high heel. So I took all that awareness to make a totem pole or totem-like piece from high heel shoes. 
And that's what I proposed to the High Line. So. so I put the link in the chat box. So if you'd like to vote for Willie Cole's um, sculpture totem, you can. <laughs> you can go on that link and, and you can vote. We all, so we selfishly would like to see um, your art on the High Line because you're in our collection. Um, so maybe a couple people from North Carolina will, will help you. <laughs> You know, this, this must be my lucky day. <laughs> Say that to the world right now. <laughs> really, is the sculpture going to be in an addition? Uh, no, because this sculpture on the High Line will be 30 feet tall. Oh my gosh. And probably about 12 feet wide. Wow. They give us that, they give us that option anyway. So. Wow. Have you I ever done that anything that large, large before? I have a piece uh, in New York, uh, in um, Long Island, not Long Island City, but down near the water in New York, in front of a school that is the entrance to the school, but it looks like a stack of books, uh, architectural, it's like four vertical books this way, and one across the top that's open to make the roof, uh. and it's the entrance to a school, and that's, that's probably my largest public art piece so far. Very cool. But I'm working on my studio now in some paintings that are like 15 feet tall by oh eight feet gosh. wide. Those are my largest paintings ever. That's fantastic. Well, we've got some, um, some questions. I also got some comments from folks. Um, so Teresa says she's in California, but she'll vote for you. Um, Liz says that she wants to see your work in Wilmington and our local pet art program. She's totally right. We need your work here. And Lane says, I regret I have to go, but thank you so much. This has been a wonderful conversation. We first connected with Willie Cole at the Weatherspoon in 2013. Thanks for sharing your tremendous vision. And then we've got some questions. Um, so Jim asks, you came from a background of ministers. Do you see yourself and your art as a ministry? <laughs> it's a great question. Is that a Bible Belt question or what? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I could say yes to that. You know, I see creativity, creative expression as a calling. And the highest level of creative expression is the one where the artist let goes and lets God. Yeah. And the power of imagery, as we spoke about regarding the t-shirt, the power of imagery allows you to influence, manipulate, sometimes even control mass thought or attitude. And that's pretty much what a minister does. So yes, I would say yes. So Phoebe has a question too. Phoebe says, has anyone ever said the high school sports trophies could also refer to Wilmington, North Carolina's Michael Jordan? He played baseball after he retired from the Bulls for the first time. Uh, if they were standing up by the trophies, they would definitely be more obvious there. But I think that any successful work of art communicates more than one thing. So the fact that she can look at those trophies and see Michael Jordan is a good thing. Yeah. yeah. Especially because the way Michael Jordan's father, he died in uh, violence. Yeah. And to yeah. see that, uh, you know, so it's connection. It's all about, like I said, jumping tracks. So we've got another question. Yolanda says, why is it that a classic blackboard gives chalk words so much power? Why is it that a classic Blackboard gives chalk words so much power. Well, the, the blackboard is the road, the chalk is the car, and the writer is the driver. Mm. So the person doing the writing was, was what really gives it power. But the perception of the speed of that vehicle in the eye of the viewer has to do with their own association with speed, power, and energy. So if you see it and it's powerful, that's because you recognize power based on your perception of power. You know, like I could write the word black. Like too, like a five-year-old kid who knows how to spell, see the word black, it's just the color black. It has, it has to do with her crayons. Yeah. 
But if I write it in a high school in uh, Nevada, North Carolina, in, in 1964, nobody thinks about crayons first. They think about skin first. You know? If I write it in, this, in uh, Salem, Massachusetts, during the witch branding trials, the first thought is going to be black magic. So, you know, perception is a, possession is one tenth of the law, perception is, <laughs> perception is 99% of understanding. Yeah, absolutely. Does anybody else have any questions? Uh, Virginia says, so good to see you, Willie. I love that you met our students in Columbia, is that Missouri, and inspired them to create. Oh, yes, one more question. Uh, Catherine says, just wanted to share how much I love your work and sharing it in the museums I work in. The scorched pieces remain my favorite. Could you elaborate on your process here a bit? Thank you for your art that gives so many a springboard of thought. Yes, uh, the scorch process, uh, scorches on wood are done with a forge, like almost like branding a horse. So the iron gets like fiery pink hot. Scorches on paper are done with a hot plate or electric stove. And scorched on canvas are also done with a hot plate or electric stove. My preferred is the uh, bigger fire outside. It's just more physical, it's more violent, you know. It gives me a chance to get a little violent because I'm not a violent person. Also, I'm afraid of getting burned, so that's another energy added to it, the energy <laughs> of fear. And uh, as you may have heard over the years, the scorches came about, the scorches came after the irons. And the irons came because my, in my mother's family, my grandmother, my great grandmother, and my mother spent part of their adult life and teenage life working as a domestic servant for, for some wealthy white man in the, in the little town he grew up in. And my great grandmother was the main one. My whole life she worked for Dr. Wynn. So much so that when I was in the sixth grade, all of my clothes had the name Bobby Wynn written in the back because her boss would give her his kids' old clothes. So whereas most kids had one pair of shoes, I had five pair of shoes. I got them all from Bobby Wynn. <laughs> so that, that was uh, my great grandmother's experience was the main catalyst for all the scorched pieces. Plus, like I said, you know, jumping, 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 the speech that Malcolm X added in there too, because Malcolm had a speech called the House Negro and the Field Negro. So clearly ministers and domestic workers are house Negroes. Now my dad was a rebel. So, you know, his brothers are all deacons. To this day, he still doesn't go to church, but the rest of his brothers do. And his father was a deacon. So my dad to me was the Field Negro. So I would contrast my mother's background, house Negro experience, my dad, few new experience, and pull that together, communicate that through the iron, thinking that the iron work all represents the journey of the Africans brought to the America and forced into slavery. Wow. And you can find a lot about that on YouTube. <laughs> I get asked that question a lot. There's even a video of me scorching on YouTube. So you can see me doing, doing my current project outside. Very cool. You know what we're all going to be doing after this. We're all going to be looking for those YouTube videos. Um, Anne is another one of your fans from Missouri. Um, she, she says they're ready for some more of your energy here in Columbia, Missouri. Does anybody? Yeah, hello, Anne. <laughs> I know Anne well. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? I hope I've gotten all of them. Well, I want to say hello to Jim Sokol, one of my favorite people in Birmingham. Ah. This has been, oh, one more message. What a wonderful evening of conversation with Willie. Thank you all. And yes, I will be looking at the videos. Okay. <laughs> and I want to say, Bob, you said your, your colleague's name was Dave, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dave had a uh, external hard drive filled with music that he brought in one day. Yes. And take, take as much as I wanted. And I'm still grooving on that same music to the day. <laughs> <laughs> we are too. <laughs> <laughs> I'm 
okay, so you know. <laughs> it's, it's so many that when I play my, my playlist on my iTunes library in my studio, there's always a new song I never heard before. Uh, yep. <laughs> and it came from his list. I, David, yeah, David got that, and I got one, and we kind of combined them both. Oh, okay. And I've lost half of mine over the, over the years, and David still has that same, wow. that same list. And yeah, you can listen to it forever. Well, thank I want to thank him for R.L. Burnside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Everything from it. Fat Possum Records is great. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, a lot, of, a lot of great music. So yesterday about this whole what I'm doing, so I'm actually trying to perfect my Robert Johnson style because that style they have yeah. like a constant one note bass. Yeah. It's muted. So I've been working on that style. And that was all inspired by those songs I got when I was down visiting you guys. <laughs> awesome. I know this is off off topic completely. Have you have you seen the documentary called You See Me Laughing? About I don't think so. the Mississippi Blues Man? If it's on yeah, YouTube. You see me laughing. It's on YouTube. It's great. And I probably it's seen really it great. Yeah, I, I <laughs> YouTube was my favorite channel and my favorite topic on YouTube is uh, art and music. So I look at videos of music and art almost daily in the evening. I said, I'm, I'm not one who gets, does the sleep thing properly. I said, after 65 years, I still don't know how to land on and go to sleep. <laughs> so as a result, I stay up till 5 a.m. every night because by five, I feel dog tired. And then I lay down and fall asleep right away. So usually like, from three o'clock to five o'clock, I'm watching YouTube. <laughs> Willie, how long have you been playing guitar? Well, I got a guitar when I was eight years old when the Beatles came to the U.S., you know? That changed a lot of people's lives. I remember saying to my dad, right after the SLM show ended, Dad, I gotta have a guitar. <laughs> <laughs> so my mom went to the pawn shop the next day and got me an electric guitar. Oh. And, I've had, and I've had one ever since. My dad's a blues man. He's a harmonica player. So I grew up watching him have jam sessions with his friends playing the blues. So I'm, I'm still into it. May we ask how your father's doing, Willie? It was such an honor to meet him. During yeah, he's doing good. Uh, he'll be 90 years old in December. Yeah. Woo. And uh, my sister's trying to get him to move to Washington, D.C. to live with her. But he wants to live alone. He... Um, he has a habit. He goes to the same restaurant for breakfast every morning and brings some back for dinner. So he doesn't cook anymore. Uh, well, you met his girlfriend too, but she's, she's yeah. they're the same age, but she's actually older than him physically. So she's not able to get around like he does anymore. But she says that she'll hear Barry White music blasting down the street. She knows him coming. So this is a 90-year-old man driving his car with Barry White blasting. <laughs> And she said, oh, here comes Willie Cole. <laughs> and he said that they hold it because of the quarantine, the restaurant is empty, but because he's an old man, they let him in. He's the only one in the restaurant. Him, the <laughs> owner, and the chef every morning. So Willie, they, is, he, is he in North Carolina? Yeah, he's in Regal Wood. He's, he's, he's in a town that used to be his grandfather's farm. That's he doesn't have that great carved cane that you gave him. Yes, yes. Yeah. So that was made by a South Carolina artist I know who lives here in New Jersey named Lester Johnson. Yeah, yes, that's my dad. Yeah. Willie, this has been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank We'd you. love to get you back you. down to the you camera. Too. We very much want to continue to work with you, Willie. I hope, I hope we can work on a future acquisition project, all of the above with you. Well, I appreciate that. You know, yeah. It's great to connect with with the museum so close to my my family roots. Yes. You know, and my time there it was was great. So thank you again. We'd love to have you back. Thank you, everyone, for being with us tonight. Uh, we love seeing you. Um, our next conversation in the series will be September twenty third. We'll be talking with Beverly McIver. Um, so I hope you'll join us then. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good seeing you, Bob. Thank you. Bye-bye.
拜拜。Bye bye.